So before we talk about sheep, I want to talk to you about goats. Because goats, I, I, my wife, she runs Bit of Hope Ranch. We got some goats. Now, goats, you may say, are pretty similar to sheep. But honestly, they're really different. Because goats are very smart. They also, they got kind of some attitude to them. If you've ever served out there at the ranch, you know they can be a little sassy. You turn your back on them, they're going to be nipping you, biting you. That's what goats do. Sheep, on the other hand, they're, they're more docile. Than, and in fact, sheep kind of got this reputation by, they go by the three Ds. Dirty, dumb, and defenseless. And now, if you ever think of your teenagers that way, <laughs> you can connect with a shepherd and a sheep. But uh, that's, that's how they think of sheep. You say, well, Matt, are there really, I don't see many sheep. Are there many around? There are over a billion sheep on this planet. So you imagine if they like bonded together, that's like a mob of sheep trying to take over the planet, a billion of them. Now these sheep, as we're going to uh, learn some things about them today, I had said to our, our creative planning team, I said, man, I, I need to tell some, some sheep jokes, right? And they said, Matt, now that's a bad idea. And I said, <laughs> said, wait a second, wait a second. Hey, with the Olympics going on, Sheep can sit around, they can watch Michael Phelps do their favorite event, the backstroke, okay? And they said, no, man, you, you, you can't do stuff like that on stage. I said, wait a second. But what if you take, what if you take an angry sheep, okay, and you take a moody cow, what do you get? You get an animal that's in a bad mood, okay? And they said, really, Matt, if you tell any more, we will cut your microphone off. I said, okay, <laughs> okay, that's it, that's it. But we are talking about uh, sheep. So we're talking about shepherds because shepherds, of course, take care of sheep. And sometimes shepherds almost get like a rep of being simple. But honestly, shepherds are very skilled in what they do and the way they care for their sheep. They have different tools we're going to look at today, a rod and a staff. And shepherds, you'll, you'll find out today, they are all about relationship. Okay, shepherds aren't just taking care of their sheep because they're a resource or a product or getting wool or meat out of them. Shepherds love their sheep. The best shepherds have great relationships with their sheep. So as we look today at Psalm 23, who has ever heard anybody talk about Psalm 23? You've heard it, you know, on TV, at a funeral, come on, raise your hand, because really, most people in America are like, yeah, I don't even go to church, but I kind of know Psalm 23, right? Something about Lord's a shepherd, and there's a valley, and there's darkness, and, and he helps me out. I got it, Pastor Matt. Okay, Psalm 23 is about a shepherd, and it is about comfort. And it is about peace. But let me tell you this. I've done a lot of funerals. And sometimes the families talk to me and say, hey, Matt, can, can, can you read Psalm 23, you know, for, for Grandpa Joe? And the reality is, in, in my heart, I can't get up and preach out of a passage that talks about a relationship with a shepherd unless I know that person has had a relationship with a shepherd. Now, my, uh, my team is telling me that our microphone is misbehaving. So we'll go here. Is that better, guys? We're good with that? Okay. So if I'm going to do a funeral and someone says, well, really, will you preach out of Psalm 23? Personally, I, I have to know through that family, through somebody that they truly had a relationship with a shepherd. I'm not going to get up and preach and say, man, they're in a better place. They, they were such a great you know, person. They, they, look, I'm, I'm dead serious here. Today, when I talk about this shepherd, if you don't know the shepherd, you can't have the comfort. You can't have the peace. You can't have the promises. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just a communicator of information today that the good shepherd wants to lead you in your life. In fact, our bottom line comes from that. If you got your takeaway, you can pull it out and see that our bottom line, that everybody is led by somebody, right? Everybody is led by somebody, whether you're self-leading yourself, whether your spouse is leading you, whether your boss honestly is leading you, whether the president's leading you, somebody is leading you. So everybody is led by somebody. The good shepherd, he offers to lead you. He offers. He doesn't force. He's not going to beg. He's not going to manipulate you. But the good shepherd that I'm going to teach you about today, he offers to lead you. And I believe after you hear what I have to say today from, from Psalms and from John, that you'll want that kind of shepherd in your life. Because when we look at Psalm 23 and talking about a shepherd, this, this shepherd, he's my shepherd. Okay, so I kind of ask you rhetorically now, is, is he your shepherd? Because he's my shepherd. And in fact, this month is kind of like a reflective month for me because um, back in 1991, 25 years to the month is when I started my journey with the Good Shepherd. I had grown up in Michigan, 
lived there until I went to college for a year. In 90, I, moved, I went to Pennsylvania, went to college, and I was like, it is so cold up north. Who's from, who's from up north? I know we, got, we had a handful in here from up north. Okay. I hate the cold weather. So when I came down here in December of 90 and got to play tennis over Christmas break, I'm like, I got to move there. So I had some friends in Charlotte, came to visit them back again in, in the spring, and decided, okay, some, something's kind of drawing me to Charlotte. So I come down here, and I, I start, I'm going to start attending UNC Charlotte in the fall of 91. So before that, in August of 91, I'm meeting with uh, some friends, the Neal family in Charlotte, Bill and Nancy and my friend Spencer and his, his sister Lindsay. And we're talking at different times about God. And then one day, we're in their kitchen with, with Nancy and with Spencer, and she opens up her Bible and for some reason starts telling me about these people in the book of Acts and how they had power in their life. People that just a couple chapters before that were scared, were nervous, were cowards. And I was like, okay, I, I, I've, I've been hearing about God for years. Why don't I have power like that? She said, well, man, I, I just can only guess that you don't have God's spirit inside you. Do you really know this shepherd? And I left that day changed. And this is now my spiritual birth month of 25 years now of walking with this shepherd, saying, God, I will choose to let you lead me. So how about this? Psalm 23, instead of me reading it to you, let me get you some visuals on it. So let's roll the video about Psalm 23. This Psalm 23, which I would say is the, is the most well-known chapter in the Bible. This guy, David, wrote it. So I'd like to know something about David. David was a shepherd, and he spent a good portion of his life hanging out with sheep. So he got to know sheep. He understood the relationship with sheep. He knew about caring for sheep. So for him to write a chapter about God being our shepherd, I think he's got some knowledge in it, some experience in it. So let's dig into this, this guy David, about what he said and what he teaches us about this shepherd, because he didn't even know the specifics that generations later, a guy would come to earth, a man named Jesus, who would say he's the son of God, who would then tell people that he was not just a shepherd, but the good shepherd. So let's take a look, starting off in John chapter 10, where Jesus is teaching about this. He's, he starts off talking about the thief. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they would have life and have it to the full. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever been robbed before. When I lived in Michigan, came home one day, and our house had been ransacked. Thief had been there. I mean, that's a terrible feeling. You know, we naturally want nothing to do with a thief. We want nothing to do with anyone who would steal or kill or destroy. So Jesus starts off with this stark contrast of saying, there is a thief, there's a killer, and I'm the shepherd who will offer to protect you from him. So he continues. Verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now you think about that. This, these sheep, these dumb, dirty, defenseless creatures, would somebody lay down their life for one of them? And Jesus says, I will do that for you if you choose to be one of my sheep. He says, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming or the thief or the killer, no, he abandons the sheep. He runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock, scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand, cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus is saying, I'm not hired to do this. I'm not getting paid to care for you. There's nothing even you owe me or can give me. I'm doing this because I care for you, a relationship I want to have with you. And it's totally on a deeper, more important level than what you could pay anybody to do. So then he wraps it up in 14 and 15. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And he says it again. I'll lay down my life for the sheep. I think, really, somebody would do that for me? If I'm dirty and dumb and defenseless and God looks at me and says, yes, I'll send my son to die for you. So I want to give you this to, to chew on for a couple minutes because usually I'll say this at the end, but if you're in a spot where you're saying, I, I don't know the shepherd, I don't have a relationship with him, let me tell you how you can know him. And for about the next 15 minutes, you can kind of let it soak. Jesus made it so simple, ABC. A is admitting that you're a sinner. Saying, okay, and most of us can go there and say, yeah, I'm, I'm not perfect, definitely not. I'm, I'm dumb, dirty, defenseless, whatever you're, however you're saying it, Matt. I've done stuff wrong. I'm a sinner. Then there's B, which this is the hinge point, where Jesus says you got to believe. 
You got to believe that I came to earth and lived a perfect life, died and rose from the dead as the only one who could take your place. The only one who could pay what needed to be paid. You need to believe that and then see, choose or commit to live for me. It's a very, it's, it's a simple path. Honestly, there's, there's not a lot to it. But as you listen to this message and think about this shepherd who makes that ask to you, you would have that chance to pray that prayer at the end today. And again, as I go through this psalm, and I'd like you to walk out here feeling comforted. Say, man, I got comfort from that. If you don't know the shepherd, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you cannot have that comfort. You can have you know, limited comfort in this life, but if you want comfort that will last forever, you got to know the shepherd. So let's dig into it. Psalm 23.1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now, if you're like me as an American, as, as a person who has stuff, a lot of times you find yourself saying, I lack a lot of things. I need more stuff. I need a bigger house. I need a better car. I need to get paid more. I need my, my kids to have better stuff. And, and, and that's okay to want better. But in Philippians 4, God spoke through Paul. He gave us a couple verses. Now, the one verse that most people like is 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ. Man, I like that one. I can make it through anything. The verse right before it, though, Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content. So when you tie that into what David said about uh, my shepherd, I, I don't have any want. He's not saying I don't need anything, that I, I don't need to, to strive for more, but he's saying whatever you've got, you need to be content with that. And that comes from a relationship with the shepherd. So contentment is what David starts out with in this relationship. So let's keep on. In verse 2, he says, he makes me lie down. The shepherd makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, this is interesting because over the years I've heard this and I always thought God was saying, Matt, you need to slow down. Matt, you need to rest more. And, and I think he's alluding to that. But let me give you a picture into the relationship between a shepherd and a sheep because a sheep doesn't like to lay down. A sheep is, a, is, again, a very defenseless creature that a lot of times it's just always scared for its safety. So for a sheep truly to lie down, four things need to happen. Number one, a sheep needs to have nourishment. A sheep spends most of its day with its head down, eating, trying to find grass and stuff to eat, so a good shepherd will lead the sheep into a place where they can eat and get nourishment. The second thing a sheep needs, it needs to have enough water. It needs to be hydrated. So a good shepherd will figure out how to get that sheep into water. We'll dig into that more in a minute. Because when you touch a sheep, if it's all dry, it's, it's dehydrated, and a sheep will not naturally feel like laying down so it's hydrated enough. Now, the third thing, and you'll probably give me the look the first service gave me, the third thing a sheep needs to do before it lies down, it needs to get its nose cleaned out. It needs a shepherd to walk on up and take a rag and cram it up its nose. You say, why would it do that? Because a sheep spends all its days with its head down, eating, sucking up, honestly, parasites. So that a sheep will have these parasites that it can't possibly get out. Not with these little stub legs. It can't get those things out. The shepherd, though, knows for a sheep to be able to lay down, he has to do something uncomfortable of getting in that sheep's space and cleaning out the parasites so that sheep can lay down. And I sit there and think, God, are you trying to teach me something in that? And he says, absolutely, I am, Matt. Two things, in fact. Number one, that we each individually need to be in communication with our shepherd so he can get the junk out. That he can get close enough to you that you'll let him get close enough to you that he's going to dig in there and get the junk out. And you know what the junk is. It's your sin, it's your thoughts, it's your intentions, it's your lust, it's whatever that is that God says, I need to get that out. The second part of it, though, is he empowers me to also do that in your life. That if you call vision home and say, that's my pastor, then when I bring a word on Sunday, sometimes you'll be sitting there saying, man, did Pastor Matt know what happened this week in my life? Did he know how I yelled at that person, did whatever? And he's talking today about, you know, controlling my temper and say, the word is coming from me to you. And part of my job, I was like, it's clean the nose out. And you're like, oh, man, that's painful. It's painful, but it's worth it. Because number four, the fourth thing a sheep needs, it needs to feel secure. As a sheep, a sheep, again, they, they can't protect themselves very well. That predator comes, they don't have a chance. That fox, I mean, you see him hopping around like he's almost like a dog. That fox will come up and take down a sheep and kill it. So the sheep, to lay down for the night, what the shepherd does is leads them either into a pen, like a permanent one that has rock around them, or if they're out in the pastures, they'll actually make 
a pen around the sheep, lead them all in through the opening where you normally would put a gate. Now, Jesus, this is so brilliant. Jesus, when he was talking about being the shepherd, he also said that he was the gate. People are like, the gate? What's that mean? People that know sheep, though, they realize that a sheep, when they are corralled into this area, they're still basically literally like looking over their shoulder like, is the predator coming? The shepherd doesn't close a gate. The shepherd lays there as the gate. The shepherd says, any predator, that before they get to you, they got to go through me. So how about that? I want a shepherd in my life who will not just set up a gate, but he'll be the gate to protect me from the predators. So the sheep need all those things before they can lie down. And I believe that's what David is saying to us too, is that you need these things in your life to be able to have that comfort, that peace to be able to lay down. Your shepherd wants to do that for you. Continues, verse 2. said, he leads me beside quiet waters. And, I, and for years I thought, man, that is so peaceful, man. God, he wants me to go by the stream and just like hear the waters until I dug into it. And I, yes, I think he wants that. But a good shepherd, he knows that a sheep is scared of water. You're like, scared of water? They need water. A sheep, let me, let me tell you about a sheep. They got four legs. Their back legs are strong. They're short, but they're very strong and sturdy. Their front legs are nimble, but they're very weak. So a sheep, it goes down toward water and has all this thick wool. It's good wool. It's right here in the front. If they happen to wander into rushing water, the water will fill up that wool. It'll get heavier and heavier and heavier until, boom, they will fall in the water and they have no chance of avoiding drowning. The sheep's gone. So a sheep, when they hear water, their first reaction is, I can't go there. But the shepherd knows they need water. So the shepherd will do one of two things. Either lead them to truly uh, calm water, like a pond or a lake, or the good shepherd will go out to that rushing water, put that bucket in the water, and walk back into the camp, into some type of cistern, and pour it in there so the sheep can go drink safely from still waters. That's what a shepherd, a good shepherd does for a sheep. Verse 3 says, he refreshes my soul. He refreshes it. Now, if you're like me, there's some days you get up and look in the mirror, and you can tell you're not feeling too refreshed. First service, we see that a lot. But here, here at Vision, we got coffee. Help with that. But God daily is a shepherd who wants to help refresh you. Because when you walk up on a flock or a herd of sheep, you can tell the quality of the shepherd by the health of the sheep. A good shepherd will take care of those sheep in a way where they're getting food. They're getting water. They're getting all the things they need to rest. They're protected from predators. They're a healthy flock or herd. That's indicative of of a good shepherd. So the good shepherd who looks over and watches over us, he wants to refresh us in a way that people will look in there and say, what about these people? Everything's not right. I mean, they almost lost their job this week, but wait a second. They're refreshed in a way that something's different about them. And that's the way our shepherd wants to be. He continues and says, he guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Now this word path in the original text, it could have meant one of two things. It could have meant either a straight and narrow path or a kind of a meandering or wandering path. And in this one, just like life, it's this meandering, wandering path. You're like, wait a second, wait a second. I thought, man, I thought this Jesus is like straight and narrow. Salvation is straight and narrow. There's one way to salvation. But you know, if you've been walking with God at all, or even if you don't know God, you're walking through life, life does this. And life does this, and life does this, and life does this. It, it's not just a, a freeway. It's a meandering, wandering path. So we see that with sheep as well. And with sheep, this is interesting. Sheep, you know, remember I told you about goats? Nip at you, a little sassy. Sheep never bite. I mean, you can put your hand in their mouth except for one time. There's only one thing you could do to them that will make them bite. Now, shepherds, they prepare for this by buying uh, vacuum cleaner belts. You know, like, that's really strange. How do they get those over there? Well, somehow people ship in vacuum cleaner belts so that shepherds have these belts. And when it's time for a sheep to bite, they put it on its mouth. And then the shepherd breaks his leg. I'm like, wait a second. The shepherd, the good shepherd, breaks the leg of the sheep? When they're going down these paths and going through life, there's some sheep that naturally their tendency is to go their own way. <laughs> Say, hey, you guys go that way, I'm going this way. There's some sheep, they'll communicate with their buddies, say, hey, go with me. Let's get off the path. 
There's some sheep that wander in the direction where the predator is. There's some sheep that wander in the direction where the thorns are. The shepherd, he, he sees all this. He knows all this. He'll try to train the sheep to stay on, on track until finally he realizes the only way we're going to correct this is by spending some time together. He puts the belt on. He breaks the sheep's leg, and you're like, oh, that's like animal abuse. Like, call PETA. Come on, that is like, that is so wrong. You know what the shepherd does? He picks up the sheep, puts that sheep on his shoulders, and for the next four weeks, he carries that sheep. Because remember what I said earlier? This thing is about relationship. This, this isn't a product he's trying to prepare for sale. This is a sheep he's trying to build a relationship with. So for four weeks, he carries that sheep. He spends time with that sheep. He talks to that sheep. He shows that sheep things so that when four weeks are over, they put that sheep back down. That sheep is tight with the shepherd. That sheep is closer to the shepherd than he's ever been before. He's not wandering off now. He's not taking people. He's not being divisive. He is closer to his shepherd than he had ever been. And you look back and think, well, in my life, do I ever go through something where I just like shake my fist at God and say, how could you let the broken leg happen? How could you put the thing on my mouth? And God says, I got a bigger plan than that. I want you close to me. Let's walk together. Verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, maybe you heard it say the shadow of death. This is like you know, the verse everybody knows. I walk through the valley of shadow of death. You know, what am I going to do? Well, it says, I'll fear, no, I'll fear no evil, for you're with me. You're riding your staff. They comfort me. Now, this verse has so much in it. Honestly, I could spend a whole message just on this verse. A couple things super quick. You think about this, this valley. The shepherd, he's, he's not saying, get this, he's not saying, I'll steer you around the valley. I'll stop you short of the valley. He's saying, the valley's going to come, and I'm going to lead you through it. And if you're like me, and you look back on your story, there's all kind of valleys you've been through. And hopefully you're walking through it with a shepherd. He'll do that. Second thing, which again, I can spend a lot of time on, is that whole shadow piece. I believe God's saying, so many of the things we fear, they're just a shadow. They can't really touch you. I can see that. As God, I can see that. You can't see that. Trust me as your shepherd. I'll lead you through that shadow. I'll lead you through that valley. But what I want to focus on in this verse is the rod and the staff. Because when you look at a shepherd, and some shepherds have one of these, some have both, but originally shepherds had both these things. They had a rod, which was a thick stick, about this tall, they'd carry around. And for years, honestly, when I'd read this passage and think, okay, rod and staff, Definitely the rod, that's like, that's like the whooping stick, right? I mean, he, you know, sometimes God's got to whoop me, and sometimes he's got to help me. So you know, all, all I could think of, I'm like, okay, like flashlight. Let's say you, know, you, got, you got something you're going to carry and, and you know, beat somebody with. and say, man, I, I don't, I don't want to get beaten with that. I don't want to. Oh, gracious. That, that woke somebody up. <laughs> now, I, I don't want a shepherd that's got something in his hands that. And I say, KJ, come here. We'll, we'll no, no, we won't try this. Okay, but honestly, who, who wants a shepherd that when you're wandering off a little bit, and he's like tasing you? Honestly, I don't want that. And that's not what Dave was talking about. The rod, the rod is for beating off predators. The rod is a stick that he carries all the time to protect you. That when that fox or that wolf or whatever comes, and he uses that rod to beat off the predators. So what about the staff? The staff, which has this like candy cane shape on the top, to find a stick like that, you usually can't find one that's thick. So you find a thinner one, so you can't really use that to beat off the predators, but you do a couple things with it. Do three things with it. Well, well first of all, we got any golfers in here? Any golfers? Come on. You can admit it. All right, golfers. Now, it, I learned years ago, when you're golfing, you hit into the woods or into the bushes, take a weapon with you. Okay, don't walk in there on your own looking for your ball. Take it like your nine iron because you got to do a couple things. If, you come, if you're playing in South Carolina somewhere, there might be a snake. So you have to beat off the snakes, or you got to shake – Shake it through the bushes to find your ball. So your shepherd's staff, he uses it to push back some brushes, to push back some branches. Look it out for this. Look it out. Watch the way you walk. Look for the thorns. Your shepherd is using that staff to clear the path. Second thing he's doing, these sheep, remember, they're walking their head down so many times. Their head's down. The shepherd will take it and wrap it against a rock to make a sound so the sheep get back on track. They get back on track by the sound that the staff makes. The third one, third reason for the staff is that sheep, remember, they're dumb. Okay, they're, they're dumb. And if you think about us a lot of times, we're kind of like sheep in that we'll start going a certain direction, like a, say like a sheep that gets off the path and starts walking into a crevice. And the shepherd's like, 
look, I'm not leading you in the crevice. Why are you going that way? One sheep, two sheep. They got like a mob mentality. Three, four, we got, okay, we got a five sheep pile up over here in the crevice. The six sheep is trying to butt his way in. Why can't I go? Why can't I go? And the shepherd will take his staff and pull him back. I say, come on, come on, that's not the way. This is the way. Again, it's not a rod. It's a staff. And the shepherd is lovingly bringing the sheep back on track. Well, verse 5, we see, prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. <clears throat> Just tiny little piece on the enemy piece, because I could talk on this more. But to sit at a table with your enemies, that sounds really weird. The only way I believe that's going to happen is if you have somebody who's working as a peacemaker to bring you and your enemy together at peace. And I say, I would love in my life the people that I'm not at peace with to have an intermediary who does that for me. But again, I could take a whole message on that. The part I want to focus on is the oil. Because for years, I, I don't know, I didn't know what they were talking about. What's the oil? Is it, what's it symbolize? A sheep has very pink skin. So they, anybody here burn easily? Burn easily, I know. And let me just tell you, like, like Dave mentioned, we, we got a lot of shade out there at the pool today. I'm serious. You can still come to the, to the event today. There's a lot of shade. And bring a chair. We forgot, I forgot to mention that. Bring a chair to the thing. Okay, but sheep. Sheep have pink skin. They have pink skin, so they, they get something that's called summer fever. That when they're out in the sun a lot, and they get this heat, this, this sun beating down on them, it'll do, uh, it'll do two things. It'll rise their body temperature to where they're feeling really bad, and it'll give them a headache. So you get to the end of the day, and again, you want these sheep to be able to relax, to lay down. So here's what the shepherd will do. He'll take the sheep, bring it up to him here, and he'll get some oil. And he'll rub that oil on a sheep's head. Now, as best I can tell, people can't really figure out if that takes away the pain. But what it does is the sheep get the benefit, truly, that the shepherd cares about their pain. So much so that, literally, sheep will line up the sheep with the, the, the fever, summer fever, will line up waiting for that oil so they can know, oh, man, my shepherd, he understands my pain. He cares about my pain. He puts that oil on my head. My cup overflows. My shepherd cares about my pain. I'll say, I get something out of that. I don't know if you do that. I, I get something out of that. So anyways, verse 6, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So think about this. A sheep that has a shepherd who'll be willing to pull him back, who'll be willing to defend him with his rod, who'll be willing to get him to still water, who'll be willing to protect him at night. That sheep get a lot of goodness. That sheep is really feeling loved. That sheep, why would they want to go anywhere else besides dwell in the house of that shepherd forever? That's totally what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to have that relationship with him that why would we want to dwell anywhere else but with him? So after hearing all this about the relationship between a shepherd and a sheep, I want you to think about that. Is, is he your shepherd? Because he's mine. But he willingly offers it to you. So you don't, I want you to remember, you don't have to be on this journey, this meandering journey. You don't have to be on it alone because there is a shepherd who wants to lead you on that journey.
All right. Say good shepherd. Good shepherd. All right. Got some next steps for you to consider taking today. The first one, those ABCs, honestly, it is that simple. That the good shepherd wants to have a relationship with you. It's so simple that in the baptism class today that Kim Thorpe's going to lead, there will be kids elementary age that have got this. They have understood this. So one of your next steps today might be saying, hey, man, I've been in church for a week or 10 years, and I never really started walking with a shepherd. So in a minute, when we close our eyes and pray, you can do that. You can start walking with him. The second thing is you can be baptized. You say, man, what, what's, what's the deal with baptism? And that's like good for church people and stuff like that. Let, let me explain about baptism. Baptism is your way to say publicly you're walking with a shepherd. Now, let me, uh, let me tell you this story. Back, remember, I, I came to Christ in 91. 98, me and Meg started attending this church, and we're like, man, this, this is great. We love being a part of this church. And God, like crazy, he calls me on staff. He calls me on staff of this church. And I'm like, I feel totally unqualified to do this, God. He's like, great, you're right where I want you. I said, okay. So I come on staff at this church. I'm like, oh, this is really hard. I'm gonna, like, how do I be a minister or a pastor or whatever? And we're kind of cruising along until the first baptism service comes up. And I'm like, oh, no, I've never been baptized. And so literally, I'm almost like my friend this week thinking, i got to go in and talk to the boss. i got to go tell him, like, he hired a staff member who hasn't been baptized. I mean, could he fire me? Is he going to get mad at me? Am I going to be embarrassed? Is he going to be embarrassed? What's going to happen and here's what I tried to do. I actually tried to rationalize it. said, hey, Meg, how about we go uh, with your dad to the creek out behind your house, and he could baptize me there. That way, It'll be done. It'll be like official, right? Check it off the box. And God was like, really? Really, man? <laughs> You're going to go hide in a creek? I said, you need to go in there and talk to him. And I went to his office. I said, whew, got something to tell you. And he's like, yeah, great. What's going on? I said, I hadn't been baptized. And they're like this pause. I'm like, oh, no, what's he thinking? And he starts clapping his hands. I'm like, what? Because he, he knew that God had something in this. He knew that a couple weeks later when we had a baptism service and uh, this old church has this old chapel and I got up in the baptistry and people see, you know, kids baptized, and they clap, and students baptized, and they clap. And they see a staff member walk up there and they're like, what's going on? <laughs> staff member is supposed to be baptized. Uh, and I walk up there. And I was like, okay, guys, I, uh, I'm a staff member here, and I've never been baptized, and I just wanted to hide from that. Because it was, it was embarrassing to come out and say, I, I've never done this. I should have done it. I, I, I almost hid and did it. But God reminded me that this is a chance to be public with it. And, you know, they clapped and everything. And I think part of what God did that day is he implanted in people's hearts, like he's going to implant in some hearts today, the fact that, you need to be baptized. If you came to Christ last week or last decade or when you were eight and you'd never been baptized and said, ah, it's kind of behind me. I kind of missed it. Or, I mean, I got baptized when I was four. I didn't know what was going on, but I got baptized. And God's saying, wait a second. If you're walking with my son, the good shepherd, then I want you to tell people about it. And the first way you do that is by being baptized. So today, Kim will lead it for the kids. Dave, who's up here, will lead it for the students and the adults. And you just go back there. And even if you're, you're nervous about it, go talk to them. You'll figure it out together. There's no pressure. You go talk to them and figure out how to be a part of being baptized today. So maybe that's your step. The third one, which I believe totally is for all of us, is walking with the Good Shepherd. Walking with him every day. You say, okay, that, that kind of interests me. How, how do I do that? Well, here at Vision, you know, we give you a takeaway card. You can take that, dig in the, dig in the Word. Go do the YouVersion app, dig in your Bible, pray, talk to God. In our, in our lobby, you see our, our core four habits. We want you to connect with people. We want you to serve and give and invite. So all these habits, these things can take place in your life to walk with him. And as I was up early yesterday morning walking and talking to God about you guys, about God, what, what would it really look like to walk with you more? He gave me three things. He said, the first thing, of course, is spending time with him. 
He just wants to spend time with you. Don't overcomplicate it. He wants to spend time with you. And when you do that, and you start doing that more and more, you're going to start hearing from him. Not out loud, most likely. Not out loud. But you're going to start feeling some nudges where he says, hey, go, go cut that person's grass and just serve them. Or he's going to nudge you and say, man, invite somebody to church. Or he's going to nudge you and say, hey, go buy that person's lunch. Or he's going to nudge you and say, hey, tell somebody about what I'm doing in your life. And you'll be at a hinge point where you either start listening to him and obeying him or you don't. So I think the first thing, really, spend time with him. That second thing, you're going to hear him. But overall, you start taking on characteristics of the good shepherd. The more you spend time with him and the more you start obeying him, you will take on characteristics of him. And I promise you, you will never be disappointed that you did that. If you hang around at Vision much, come to our leadership meetings, you hear me talking all the time to our leaders saying, you're a shepherd. What you're doing to those leaders is a shepherd. What you're there with those kids is a shepherd. What you're doing in the parking lot, welcome people in, you're a shepherd. Shepherd people, share God's love. The shepherd's love, share it through you to impact people with his love.